Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation in memory of Richard Hefner, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Angelson Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Joan Gantz Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Today we'll continue to contemplate our digital future as we expand on recent conversations with Sue Gardner of Wikipedia and Mitchell Baker of Firefox, some years before Biz Stone co-invented Twitter, podcasting, and blogging. On the cutting edge in all three instances, there was television, and specifically educational broadcasting, where we're fortunate he joins us here today in this admittedly old school forum. The creation of Twitter, as told by Stone in Things a Little Bird Told Me, Confessions of the Creative Mind, is a fascinating dive into our tech culture, the creative design behind the omnipresent storyboard and increasingly story shaper of our times. Stone calls the innovation a triumph not of technology but of humanity, while its co-founder insists that the little birdie is a neutral force in the world. Twitter was the vehicle through which the Arab Spring Revolution manifested, and it's the platform on which he calls new rules of the masses are now established. He writes, the internet and mobile devices have connected the world like never before. The onset of social media motivated another steep acceleration in connectivity. For almost a decade now, we've been friending, following, liking, and in other ways amassing a prodigious network of virtual connections without a long-term goal. What's it all for? That's the question you present and answer in your fascinating book, Biz. Thank you for being on The Open Mind today. Thanks for having me, Alexander. You say, in some large measure, to breed empathy. Well, that's what I hope. I mean, I, I sort of have a, a hallucinogenically optimistic point of view. and that I often get a lot of rolling eyes when I talk to people about you know the future of technology and of social media but really um, what I hope will happen is that you know because we can experience life uh, through another person's eyes halfway across the world because of these new technologies um, just while we're waiting in line at the grocery store you know it, it, it makes it easier to place yourself in their shoes and empathize with someone and see how different your life is and what their life is like and you know what I hope is that as we learn more and more about other people's way of life we, we begin to think of ourselves not as citizens of a particular city or state or country but of citizens of the world and and if you take that out even further, um, you imagine uh, you know this sort of utopian future where people are collaborating. Um, and can you imagine what we could get done if if the world were to collaborate um, on big projects like exploration of space and so forth? We we would get things done in in a in in like a year that it would take decades to do instead of you know companies reinventing the wheel every time you know if we were collaborating it would just be amazing and then I, I think well I hope I hope that these early beginnings of social media are the beginnings of that uh, they're allowing people to collaborate like never before you know you know I mean um, we can talk about it a little bit later but the, the first time I really and truly realized that Twitter um, had a future as an important tool it was it was in uh, March of 2007 and, and my point of view was completely altered and uh, and it was um, sort of a 
life-changing moment. But uh, anyway, this is my hope that you know, as as it gets more sophisticated, these types of tools and social media will allow people to collaborate around the world and do amazing things because that's what people do. They do amazing things, and it's not that, like I say, it's not the it's not the technology; it's the people. You want to take that life-changing moment, Biz and extend it to realize what you call the true promise of a connected society in your work on, with Twitter and Jelly and your newest app. How, how do we move towards that ultimate goal amid this patchwork of Twitter, Facebook, Vine, you name yeah. it? Yeah. Well, uh, something I learned uh, along the way here is, um, you know, you, you really have to build something that's fun first. It has to just be for fun. Because if something's fun, then people will use it. And if a lot of people use it, then it has the potential to become important. You can't just create something that you think is important, because then nobody will use it. And if nobody uses it, then it won't make a difference in the world. So starting with fun, starting as a toy, you know, starting out where everyone's criticizing you and telling you it's silly and useless and stupid and there's no need for it, that's that's fine as long as people are getting more and more interested and then suddenly you have something that's uh, never before been seen and it allows people to do things that they, they heretofore were not able to do and so um, the short answer is you know you have to you have to come from a point of view of fun you know you're even if you're even if your ultimate goal is to build a platform where very important things take place uh, which they have. It has to be, you also have to be able to just make jokes with your friends. You know, I mean, look, look at all these big networks. Twitter it was just started out, we, Jack and I built it because we thought it was fun. Look at Snapchat, you know, even Facebook to a certain extent. It was just, it was just for fun in the college. And now it's, you know, one seventh of the population of planet Earth uses it to communicate. So, amazing. You just have to begin as a toy. And, um, you know, play, the, the, the essence of play, and then that leads to important, if you're lucky. In that environment of play, you've described not wanting to be apolitical while you were at, at Twitter, but you really are imagining a pro-social digital future. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, at, at not, and a pro-social um, future in general for everything. I mean, I talk about, in my book, I talk about the future of marketing being philanthropy. Um, and again, another eye roller, you know, for a lot of people, like, oh, geez, this guy. Um, he might as well be in Birkenstocks. He really is a Northern <laughs> California guy, even though I grew up in Boston. Um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not governments that are going to change the world. It's, it's people, and it's, and it's private industry. And, um, and if, uh, if more and more companies have this so-called double bottom line, then as they do well, they'll do good. And, uh, and the side effect will be, um, you know, a better world. Do you think that Twitter now is being governed with that sensibility? Well, we instilled Twitter with that idea of, that, of Twitter for good. You know, Twitter is a, a tool um, for good. The idea that, uh, you know, I always talked about this internally. I, you know, I don't work at Twitter day to day anymore, but I always talked about people are basically and fundamentally good and if you build a tool uh, that helps them uh, show that they'll prove it to you every single day and and so we always talked about that at Twitter we talked about um, helping people do the right thing and helping people do the good thing and yes I think Twitter is still very much involved in that they you know they do a lot for the community where the headquarters is based in San Francisco um, there's a lot of good that's going on. And talk about your latest projects because you said off camera that yeah. you wanted to explore that a bit. Yeah, my, well, see, what we did was um, I stopped working at uh, I stopped working at Twitter day to day, and I, I I created another publishing platform with my longtime collaborator Evan Williams called Medium, which is uh, another way of um, just basically another publishing another web-based publishing platform, um, and. And then I just found that we were agreeing so much, I should go off and I should do even something else to create more surface area. So Ben Finkel and I, my, my co-founder at Jelly Industries, we, um, we came up with this idea for, uh, 
for a new kind of search engine, which didn't rely on documents that were on the web, instead relied on uh, what people know. Um, the idea being that most of the world's knowledge is still in people's heads. It's not documented on the internet. No matter how much there seems to be on the internet, there really is far more information and knowledge uh, out there in people's heads. So it was based on the idea that mobile phones are now the, the hyperlinks of humanity. So if you have a question, um, likely one of your contacts will either know the answer or they'll know someone who knows the answer so they can go ahead and forward it. And that plus social networking, you know, the new six degrees of separation is actually uh, something like 3.8 or something like this. So because of social networks and mobile. So we did that. We built this new kind of search engine. And um, for whatever reason, people either weren't asking or didn't have questions uh, for us. Um, it, it was, it was the, the app was successful if you were one or two people um, and you were in your mom's basement, you know. But we, we really wanted to have something bigger than that. And um, so we, we employed what I talk about in my book. Um, we employed my bright spot theory. When everything looks terrible, you know, everything looks dark. Um, there's got to be something that's good. Look for that. And so I went to my COO, um, Kevin Thaw, and I said, let's look at the numbers and the charts and the graphs and see if we see what, what, what's good about Jelly. What, what have we done that's successful? And he says, nothing. We're, we're screwed. It's every, nothing's going to work. It's all terrible. I said, no, come on, really. There's got to be something. Let's look. And he said, well, um, for, every, uh, for every question, Surprisingly, there's 30 or 40 answers. So, so people are loving answering, but they have to wait for lightning to strike in the form of a question to finally to get their opinion or recommendation or something out. And I said, so you're telling me people like to express their opinion on the internet. Is this is <laughs> what you're telling me? So I, I said, let's lock ourselves in a room and come up with a new idea. And I knew what I wanted to do, and I, but I didn't tell the guys. I said, Ben, Kevin, meet me, meet me in this at this place called Cavallo Point. We're, we're not leaving until we have a new concept for the team. And the new concept was essentially to flip this on its head. Um, instead of question and answer, it was really sort of answer and then a search engine built on top of it. And the idea was, let's just create an incredibly creative and fun way that allows people to express themselves. And, um, and I went back to my roots as an artist. I was inspired by Barbara Kruger. We made this app that is just wildly different from any other app. It, it it's just throws Precious out the window. It's just wild and crazy and colorful. And um, the idea was we would start, we start you off with a superlative statement, hence the, the name of the app is called Super. Um, we, we start you off with you can choose the best, the worst, the craziest, the sexiest. I mean, we, got, we started to get longer, and I started editing them to I love and this and that. But the idea is you just finish that. You say, the best espresso comes from Italy. And then we also assume people are kind of lazy. So when you hit next, automatically an image of espresso from Google Images is thrown behind this. And you, you automatically you have this kind of little work of art. And, um, and it's something that you wouldn't necessarily have tweeted because it's not that, um, it's not really that great of a tweet. It's not very clever. And it's a photo that you wouldn't necessarily have sent to Instagram because you're not trying to capture some beautiful moment. But it's a celebration of this mashup culture. The two together form something unique. For example, just the other day, my friend Brian, he read this, um, he read this article, that, something about Auschwitz that had recently come to light. And so he took the picture from the article, and all he wrote, all, he didn't even add anything to it. He just used one of our starters. He, he just layered upon it, unbelievable. And he pushed that out and distributed that to some of his other social networks. And immediately, you, could, you, you, you sensed how emotional he was about that. You could, you could feel that, he, um, that that moved him. Um, and then there was a link, of course, to the piece if you wanted to read it. But with just one word and one image, he made a, a bold statement. And so... Super really allows um, ordinary people to create extraordinary content very easily. And, and these, uh, these thoughts and these expressions, they become little works of art. And, uh, and now we're going even deeper um, with, our, with our new feature where we're creating what we're calling strips, which is 
sure, you can create one of these supers, but if you want to tell a much longer story, you can go ahead and, you know, it's a typical feed format super where you scroll through what your friends are, are expressing, but then you may get to one that is a multi-page story. Uh, and then you're, now you're sweeping it to the, see, that, this is the things you can do on mobile, you know, it's so great. And so uh, all of a sudden you're reading a story or a collection or whatever. I, who knows what people are going to do with it? That's the beauty. We leave it, we, we come up with some constraint because I do believe that constraint inspires creativity. But then we leave it at that. We see what people are doing with it and we watch for patterns and we'll add features as, as necessary. And that constraint that you describe, which really made Twitter the, the, the most unique of any of the social media that have emerged, is something you're applying now. Mm -hmm. And you're always applying the creativity of your mind. And you talk a bit about how you want to redefine capitalism for yeah. this creative age. Yeah. What does that mean? Again, another, another ridiculously optimistic thing, but I, I, if nobody says it, then nobody will go for it. Um, the idea for what I'd like to see is a redefinition of success in capitalism, such that capitalism, success in capitalism now has three ingredients. One, traditional financial success, what it is now. Two, some kind of um, pro-social impact in the world. And three, joy, loving your work. And the idea is, if you don't have all three of these ingredients, you are not successful. And, <laughs> and you know, a lot of people are going to say, come on. But you got to put it out there. You, gotta, you always have to be Life, aspirational. liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right. You got you to gotta put it out there or you're not going to get, you're not going to, you won't, you'll just say, okay, we're here now. We're, we're staying here. Let's move the ball forward, you know? Oh, I love that idea of a redefinition of capitalism. Will it ever work in a metric-driven economy? I think it has to. It, it will because it has to. Um, like I said before, you know, it's, it's not going to be governments uh, that are going to bring about um, the change we need brought about in the world. It's going to be individuals and private organizations. And if they, if they have, um, if they redefine their, uh, what, they def what, they, what they think of as value, as not just money, but also having some kind of a positive impact in the world, then as they do well, they'll do good. And as, as, they, as these some, some companies make it and get bigger and bigger and bigger, the more good they'll do in the world. You know, the ideal situation is to be, is to be uh, financially, like, just amazingly rich and wealthy, but at the same time, bringing so many people with you. There's a, there's a wonderful uh, company in Mexico um, that... Uh, that copied um, Mohammed Yunus's Grameen Bank model. Um, and instead of making it a nonprofit, they made it a for profit. They raised the, you know, but this is the micro lending and, and, mm -hmm. and, and um, to gr small groups of women who then go on to create their own uh, enterprises. So all throughout Mexico and Latin America, they are lending money to these groups of women. And instead of a nonprofit, it's a for profit. And they, the, they raise the uh, the rates a little bit, but not too much. Instead of having a hundred percent payback rate like Grameen Bank, they have a ninety nine point nine percent payback rate or something like this. So they have a three billion dollar market cap on the Mexican stock exchange, and they're they're creating a better life for all of these women throughout uh, Mexico and Latin America. So I. I went and I met these guys and I said, you guys have the best jobs in the world. You're becoming wealthy and you're, you're enabling all of these people to have a better life and create a better life for themselves. This is the best thing ever. And you love your job. You know, like, these guys are a perfect example of what, you, what, what you know, the redefinition of success would look like. Are tech entrepreneurs distinct, you think, in, in this, sharing this kind of sensibility? No, not necessarily. I don't think so. Um, you know, I'm on the board of a company called Beyond Meat, which makes um, meat out of plants. And um, this, again, the, you know, the, the impact of this product is um, extremely good. It's in, it has environmental impacts that are positive. It has health impacts that are positive, um, you know, sustainability, all of these things. And uh, it's not a tech company. I mean, you could think of it as a tech company, but it's a food company. So. It's not unique, um, 
and it, you know, it's the future. I mean, it, the young people, millennials, people, people coming up now, they want to choose products and services that they know have something meaningful behind them. The, these days, you, you can know everything and anything you want about any product and any company, not just the ingredients, um, but what the CEO ate for breakfast. You can find this out. What, you, know, you can find out what um, pro-social campaigns the, the companies are running. You know? So if you are choosing between two flavored sugar waters, you choose the one that you think, just by buying it, is going to be doing something, and it makes you feel better. And this is, this is why I believe um, you know, it's just going to happen. You know, mm -hmm. and, and it's not just on the consumer side. It's also on uh, attracting talent. Uh, you know, uh, the type of people who are really good at what they do, and they can, they can sort of name their price for, in terms of salary, um, they want to go to the companies that um, bring meaning to their life. So they'll choose the company that is um, saying, you know, we're doing, we're also doing this. Uh, so I think and it's what's, just what's the deterrent to to um, having a, a population, an American population, or generally a global pop population that uh, is me centric and that uh, that that finds the fun not in the form of marrying those two principles, but in the form of off camera had some dialogue about crotch. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, I had this... For me, I found out years ago that what brings me the most joy is helping other people. Uh, you know, you, you find what... And as you get older, you figure out what There's you a like. preponderance of people who... And, I, and so I... And, and, and there is a lot of people. You know, when, when you go volunteer, you donate and you get the thank you... You donate to some children, you get thank you cards or something. You feel great. There's, you know, I mean, I, I like to say that... Um, being self selfless is often selfish, because you get the reward is so much greater than than, than what you um, what you're offering. But uh, you know, so I found out that what I like to do what really brings me joy and my wife is helping other people, and uh, I sort of assume that that's what everybody wants to do. <laughs> you know? Is that a constraint that you would add to these social media? What? What's that? Doing something good. Be, being a good Samaritan. Yeah. Um, because a, I think about your emphasis on 140 characters, mm -hmm. and then we talk about well, what is in the photo, what is in the tweet. Yeah. Do, as, a, as an entrepreneur, are you, do you ever foresee imposing no, that constraint? I don't think, uh, yeah, you can't, you shouldn't come at it head on. I think it has to be sort of a side effect or, or a, something that goes along with it. If you, if you attack this head on, then then you make people feel like they have to do a chore. You know, the, the, you, you turn it into a chore, as opposed to turning it into just a, a positive side effect, like a like a, you know you're winning, you know, mm -hmm. you're winning by doing this. And that that's how it has to feel. If you force it, it doesn't work. Sue Gardner and um, Mitchell Baker and Sue Herman, the president of the ACLU, when they came here, we were talking about issues of freedom of speech on the web surveillance, net neutrality, um, how we, we don't take for granted uh, those things in a mm -hmm. digital world, um, yeah. and also the existence of something like Wikipedia, which we uh, have... A, a Love Wikipedia. So um, what are your current thoughts? You say in the book that you're proud that uh, Twitter did not give in to mm -hmm. the demand of the government uh, to um, supply information on intelligence yeah. of private users. Um, in, in, this, in this day and age now, are your, are your thoughts um, the same? Yeah, I still, I mean, over, you know, I've been doing this now for over 15 years, building these large-scale systems that allow people to express themselves and communicate, and in some cases, a tweet is the only way they can get their message out. And uh, I, I'm a strong believer that freedom of speech should be a basic human right, and um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I did, I said, I was proud, you know, we, we, very early on we said, you know what, um, you, you, you're going to need a subpoena for that kind of information. We don't have a fax machine, so you're going to have to send someone over. And we just made it as difficult as possible because we said, this is their information. It belongs to them. And if and you, you were the it, outlier. Yeah. In, right. Compared I mean, to the telecommunications Well, because companies. it just, I can, I can understand you know, when the State Department comes to you and says, you know, it, you want to do, it's, you, you want to do the right thing, but 
um, you can't, you know, it's, it's difficult. You, if you want to create a system like this, you have to err on the side of freedom of speech and then um, have a very narrow policy when it comes to what you should hide or remove. Um, because not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's it's the practical thing to do. How do you how can you possibly look through the number the billions of tweets that come through every forty eight hours and and review them for content? It's just it's impractical as well as um, mm -hmm. not the right thing to do. You know, so it's just you know this is even just, though the State Department and the CIA are probably attempting to do that, right? Of course, I mean they can look through the public tweets is well, just like anyone else if they want to but um, but when it comes to the private information you know that's something that belongs to the individual finally what about net neutrality is that a freedom of speech issue I don't know but you know an open and free internet has just created so much amazing so many amazing things have happened and people have done so many amazing things. I, I can't help but think we, we have to let this play out and keep going. You know, we just don't want don't to put an end to that. You know, let's, we're only just beginning. Let's, let's see what happens. You know, let's, let's get to that utopian future where everyone's coordinating and collaborating. I'm like, let's wait and see. Let's, let's let this play out. And that utopian future? is, I, I want to read into your answer a little bit more, that utopian future um, demands a free lane for anyone who wants internet access as opposed to monopoly Special lanes. Special lanes, right. yeah, I think so. I think we just have to have open, even, fair, and it's fair all around. And uh, well, that's brother, the be. brother, I could call you brother John Ash <laughs> or Paul Revere from Massachusetts, taking um, the aspiration of America's beginnings yeah. into the digital future. Thank you, Biz Stone, for joining me today on the Open Mind. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your time. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other Open Mind interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation in memory of Richard Hefner, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Angelson Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Joan Gantz Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.